Hello and welcome to our detailed review of Charterstone. Thanks, Jamie of Stonemeyer Games, for sending us a review copy of Charterstone to check out. So Charterstone was designed by Jamie Stegmeyer, features artwork from Lena Cassette and Dave Forrest, graphic design by Christine Santana, and a solo mode developed by Morton Monrad Henderson and David J. Studley. It was originally published by Stonemeyer Games in 2017, and is still readily available and in print at the time we are doing this review. Now, Charterstone is a campaign game for one to six players, with each game taking around an hour, with some games going longer and a couple going shorter. Now, this legacy game has an MSRP of $80 US. Note, for the majority of this review, we will be doing our best not to spoil anything about Charterstone and its campaign. That said, Due to the amount of content that gets unlocked while you are playing, and the way, uh, the way the rules change over time, we'll be including some information about later aspects of the game, but saving them for the end of tonight's mm -hmm. review. So you'll easily be able to skip ahead if you want to. Now, Charterstone is a legacy-style campaign game where each player takes control of one of six charters in a newly founded fantasy city. Each game, players will compete for points and honor while trying to develop their own charter, as well as trying to meet a scenario-specific goal. While building their charters, players will build buildings, permanently adding them to an evolving map, and unlock crates that provide new rules and gameplay elements. At the end of each game, you'll be rewarded or punished based on how well you completed the scenario's goal, and everyone will get to improve their charters, allowing them to carry over items between games or get start-of-game bonuses for the next game. At the end of 12 games, one player is awarded the win for the entire campaign. The game doesn't end there, though, as now your group has their own unique copy of Charterstone that they can continue to play. While not completely unique, it is one of the few legacy games where you're not done with the board once the game is complete. Correct. So for a spoiler-free look at the components you get in this campaign game, check out the Charterstone unboxing video on YouTube. Now, as far as component quality goes, Charterstone's near perfect. Uh, my only complaint at all is that many of the cards in the game have stickers on them that you have to peel off, and that's a little difficult to do without bending the cards. Now, normally this is an issue with stickers. You just bend them all as much as you want, as long as you get the sticker off. But in this game, most of the sticker cards then need to be shuffled back into a deck once the sticker is removed. While I found this annoying, we never actually found it ruined the game or marked the cards in a way that gave anyone any real advantage while playing. Your mileage may vary here. Perhaps a small knife to get the stickers started could help yeah. them remain flat or just riffle shuffle till they're all bent the same way. Now... <laughs> Didn't you also have a glue problem on the lid of one of the boxes? You know what? That came up in our unboxing video, and I completely forgot about it, because when I did the unboxing, I fixed it. So yes, the index, which is like the, the big box of all the stuff you're going to unlock, has a magnetic flap that closes. Mine was completely disconnected. When I tried to take it out of the box, it did pop apart. Now, some white glue and some elastics did fix that, but that just goes to show how long ago it was that we started this campaign that I actually completely forgot that problem. Again, no impact on gameplay, just a little physical component issue. Now, besides the sticker issue, the components in Charterstone are awesome. Uh, the various meeples are great looking, uh, easy to tell apart. The card quality is excellent. The various boxes to organize everything actually works great. It's almost like the game comes with a box in certain way, even though it's just a bunch of boxes. Uh, the metal coins are fantastic. Uh, the wooden resources each have a unique shape and color, which is good for accessibility. Uh, the rule book's pretty clear. Um, there is an FAQ out there, and you are going to want to look at it. But thankfully, in the later printings of the game, this is included. My game had the most recent FAQ. Um, you can easily go online to compare to make sure you have the most recent. Um, I also appreciate they included a two-sided board with the game. Uh, this is so you can actually play through the campaign twice. No note to use the other side of the board. You do have to pick up the Charterstone Recharge Pack, which is sold separately. Now, with that overview done, I think it's time to move on to talking about how you play this competitive campaign game. So while the rules in Charterstone do evolve as you play through the basic campaign, the basic game structure will stay the same for every single one of your 12 games. So each game starts with everyone gathering the stuff for their charter. Now, you get a box for every charter and you store your stuff in there. You then go through setup, which involves placing things on the board, 
randomly building buildings for charters that aren't being played. They're called inactive charters. Now you do this to keep the board balanced and make sure to provide plenty of worker placement slots while also allowing a player to join in partway through the campaign. So even the charters that aren't being played will evolve and get more buildings added to them. This joining in partway through is a really nice feature. And I have to say from my experience, it actually works pretty smoothly. Now, while you may not know what's happening in the mm -hmm. wider sense, you don't feel like you're a mile behind everybody. Uh, next, players are going to pick one of their Persona cards to use for this game. Now, for your first game, you only have one Persona card, but you'll be unlocking more regularly as the campaign goes on. Now, each Persona card provides a unique asymmetric ability. Now, also, at the end of the campaign, you're going to get points for each Persona you actually used, so it encourages you to swap out Personas every game. And we all know this show's opinion on asymmetric player abilities. Uh, next, players gain starting bonuses. These are going to be unlocked through previous games. So on your little charter box, you've got stuff you can mark off, and you're going to earn points based on how well you score at the end of each game, which each 10 points gives you the ability to fill in one star on your box. Now, when you fill in a complete row of stars, you unlock a bonus. There's all kinds of these on the box, and they include things like starting with different resources, starting with money, getting to take cards from the market before the game starts, the ability to use more than one persona, and more. Needless to say, while they're just colored in stars on a tuck box, they play a pretty important role in the yes. game. Next, the Charter Stone die is rolled. This is a unique die with a symbol for each of the charters on it to determine who starts the game. In every game, every player gets an equal amount of turns, so you can keep the Charter Stone to mark that. Now, once you start playing on your turn, you have two choices, either place out a worker or collect all of your workers already placed on the board. Now, workers are placed on buildings, each of which is going to list a cost and a benefit. You pay the cost, get the benefit. Now, some buildings, for example, the basic production buildings have no cost. You just place it and get the benefit. If you place your worker on a spot where there's another player's worker, you bump them, they get the worker back and you get to take the action. Which is important since otherwise they'd need a full turn to recover their workers. Now, at the very start of your Charterstone campaign, each charter is going to have one basic resource building. There's a spot that generates one of the six resources with each charter producing a different resource. In addition to this, there's six buildings already printed on the board. During setup for your first game, players will also get a number of cards, which they'll need to use these buildings. As the campaign continues, players will be adding a lot more buildings to the map. So stickers, stickers, and more stickers. Now, before I get into what the buildings do, I need to mention influence. Every player starts with 12 influence tokens. These are spent to take various actions in the game and are part of the game's timing mechanism as well. If a player ever runs out of influence tokens, not only are their, limited, their options now limited, but the progress track advances every time it's their turn, which can quickly bring the game to its end. Which could be your goal or something you're trying to avoid. Another tricky aspect of this game you need to work out for yourself. Now, the basic buildings already in the map include the Zeppelin. That lets you build a new building. You pay three of those influence tokens and four resources shown on the building card you have, and then you put the sticker on the board. Um, you remove the sticker, place it somewhere in your charter. Now, this is going to score you points and also advance the progress track. Now, after building, if the card you built has a crate symbol on it, and most do, especially at the beginning of the game, you then keep the card. And the reason is for the next building, the Charter Stone. When you use the Charter Stone, you pay four coins, you turn in some more influence, and then you turn in a building card that's already been built that has a crate on it. You look up that crate number on the chart and start removing cards from the index. Again, the index is a big box of stuff you can unlock. Now, during doing this, you may introduce new game rules. You may get more cards to add to your hand. You may get more cards to add to the supply. Uh, it may award the player opening the crate new buildings and personas and more. There's lots of things to unlock in this game. You might even need to open up another box that comes with the game and unlock new components instead of just new cards. Unlocking crates is the main way the game evolves during play. Unlocking crates also scores you points and events as the progress track. Not surprisingly, one of, if not the, main game advancing me me mechanic is triggered by using the building the game is named after. Yes, that is the Charter Stone. Now, the treasury spot on the board lets you exchange goods for gold, and the market lets you trade gold and a resource to take a card from the advancement map. 
Now, this advancement mat is a separate board that holds an advancement deck and five face-up cards you can choose from. Now, at the very beginning of the game, you may not even have five to put into play. These start off just being buildings you can build. But that deck, the advancement deck, quickly grows as the game goes on and eventually features multiple different card types. And if the game was only the crates, you'd find the lack of variety wear on you by the end of each game. Yeah. But this is a nice way to keep even more fresh content available. Now, another sideboard holds a deck and a set of three face-up objective cards. Players can claim these by going to the bandstand, which again scores them points and advances the progress track. Uh, this action costs an influence token. Now, the objective deck again starts off small and grows during the game and includes things like having one of each resource type, collecting six gold in total, and more. Pretty standard objective system for this sort of game. Nothing that's going to wow you, but an important part of this style of game. Now, the final way to score victory points, at least when the game starts off, is to go to the cloud port. Here, you can trade in various things for points based on what's called the quota track, a little grid in the top of the board. What you can turn in includes cards, resources, and coins, as well as more things later on as you unlock them. Now, the quota track includes some spots where you can gain bonus points or reputation for filling in those orders. Now, reputation is another track on the board where every time you gain reputation, you take one of your influence tokens and put it on this track. At the end of the game, this is an area majority thing. The players will score points for having the most, second most, and third most reputation on this track. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of tracks and things to worry about. Because it's a legacy game, it starts off slow and really lets you grasp everything firmly. Now, as mentioned already, various actions will advance the progress marker. We keep talking about this. This is another track that forms the timer for the game. The length of the track is based on the player count, and the game ends with every player getting an equal number of turns once the progress marker hits the end of the track. Now, along this track, there are also some icons that indicate the player who caused the marker to move gets some kind of reward. Now, at the start of the campaign, this only includes reputation, but there will be something else unlocked later. Get there faster, get a reward, but end the game sooner. Now, in addition to these basic worker placement spots, of course, players are going to be adding a ton more spots to the board that do all kinds of things, like you know, the ability to trade in resources for different rewards, the ability to buy specific cards from the market, improved ways to build buildings and unlock crates that are worth more points, and other uses for influence tokens as well as plenty more. Now, as well as giving everyone more things to do, each building you build gives the player controlling it points at the end of the campaign, which can lead to some pretty interesting decisions about what buildings to build, if you should be building the building for the ability on it, or if you want to build it for the points. I mean, it is a legacy game after all. Now, at the end of each game, everyone calculates their final score for that game. This includes points for the rank on the reputation track I mentioned earlier, and any end game scoring cards the players may have collected. Next, you check to see who best fulfilled the goal of the scenario as indicated on a guide postcard. And the note in the first game, you won't have a guide postcard, but you're going to see those so early that I don't even feel like it's a spoiler mentioning them. You're then going to scratch off this card and do what it says. Um, my wife commented in the chat room here that one of the things she doesn't like about the game is trying to scratch off that card because the metal coins included don't do a very good job. We also don't suggest using any of the resources. You might want to get an actual coin when trying to do it. So what you do is you scratch it off. I like a scratch ticket and then do what the card says. Now, in most scenarios, I'd say many of the scenarios, the player who earned the card is going to get a choice. Now, that choice could affect the scoring of this game, unlock new things, add new rules, etc. Now, after completing whatever it says on the guide postcard, the player with the most points wins. They get to mark off a trophy on their character box, which is worth points at the end of the campaign, and everyone else gets to fill in a capacity circle on their box. Now, every circle filled in on that box lets you carry over one thing from this game to the next, and don't um, decide how important that can be. Now, for those who've been listening along with the plays will know, winning a game is not the be-all and end-all. This is an ongoing process, so pace yourself. Finally, players are awarded glory. Everyone gets one glory for every 10 points they scored this game, with a bonus point given to the player who best completed the scenario goal, whoever claimed the guide postcard. Each point lets you fill in one star on your character box, as I already talked about before, with the setup where you get bonus stuff for the next game. 
Also know every point of glory gives you points at the end of the campaign, and it's a significant amount. It's 10 per star you fill in. After you finish your game, you pack everything up or play again, but make sure you only carry over the proper things based on what you've unlocked on your charter box because you don't want to take too much stuff or not take what you can carry over. Cleaning up, scoring, and making sure the right things go in your box and nothing else is probably the hardest part of that game. Yeah. And yet it's still not really that hard. Just also be sure, just as uh, again, Deanna's in the chat room, be sure you're using your box while playing the game and not putting stuff in someone else's box, <laughs> which seemed to be an ongoing problem in our particular Charter Stone games. So at the end of your 12 campaign game, there's a final scoring system, which I can't talk about much because it's not fully explained until partway through the campaign. You don't even know everything you're going to be scoring. What you do know from the start is that you're going to be scoring points on your buildings, the personas you used, the glory you've earned, and points for the games you've won. Okay, that covers the basics of how Charterstone plays. What did you and your group think of this legacy game? So I wasn't sure what to expect when we first sat down to start our Charterstone campaign. The reviews I've read, watched, and listened to since it came out were very mixed. Many of the early reviews called the game too simple, and I saw the term basic worker placement game thrown around quite a bit. Now, one thing I noticed, though, is that many of these reviews weren't from people who played the entire campaign. It seemed quite a few people played the first game or first couple of games, shared their thoughts, and then moved on. Or if they didn't move on and continued to play, they never went back and updated everyone to say what they thought once they finished the campaign. It does seem that there was a trend of people who started it, lost interest, and moved on, or perhaps lost a couple of games and felt it wasn't possible to win at that point and gave up. Yeah, that is highly possible, which please don't do that. There, there, there's <laughs> Losing a few games isn't going to mean that much in this. Now, when I agreed to review this game, I knew the first thing I knew when I said yes was I don't want to do this. I wanted to be in for the long haul since day one. While I've been sharing some thoughts on the Bellhops Tabletop segment of our podcast and sharing it on the What You've Been Playing Wednesday, some of our thoughts as we play through the campaign, I wanted to save this, my final review, for once we are actually done our campaign, playing all 12 games. Now, we even took it a step further than that. Since once you're done Charterstone campaign, you can continue to play your unique copy of the game. I wanted to try that as well before reviewing the game. So here I am now. Campaign's done, and we even tried an after campaign game. So overall, how'd it go? Great. Well, that's it, folks. Thanks for coming out to our review of Charterstone from Stonemeyer Games. Oops, sorry. A few more thoughts. <laughs> I worry something. That's long enough. Someone might just like turn off YouTube. We, we might want to cut that out. All right. So while I do agree, Charterstone starts off as a pretty basic, straightforward worker placement game, but it evolves into something so much more. It's pretty early into the game, you start unlocking more things, giving all of the players more options. Now for us, game three was the big game, the game where we unlocked so much stuff, it almost felt like we were playing a new game. And setup for game four was actually confusing because there were so many new game elements. And for a bit there, everyone was literally lost because they were just like, whoa, there's this and that and that and this. And what are we doing? And what's the goal? And now we have to worry about this. It can actually be overwhelming when you hit that big. It's almost like a cliff where you're like, OK, yeah, I get it. And say, whoa, what is all this stuff? See, this was really interesting for me, not because I was playing, but because I was watching at a distance. Uh, and I had gone through knowing I wasn't going to be able to play more than the one game I did play and read a lot of reviews and player thoughts on the game. Mm. And the reviews I read had indicated things like this at this time were going to happen. And it was really interesting hearing your playthrough sort of matching those expectations mm. and, and these the, these weirdness and, and, and shock coming through yes. at the right time. <laughs> It seems like it's game three or four for most people. So I would honestly say, like, if you're going to try, don't give up till you hit that. If you haven't hit a part where you're just like, whoa, whoa, what's happening? You might want to keep trying. Now, added to the fun, brought on by added complexity, as Charterstone evolves, you also get a pretty solid story that features Branson Pass. Now, this isn't a big novella. You're not having a big epic story. But after each game, you, you, you have a goal, and how well you do on that goal determines the reward 
as well as affecting the story and potential future games. And I'm trying to be vague here, and it's a little hard. Um, these rewards can be positive or negative, and I've got to say some were a huge shock to our group. Once again, winning or losing each individual game is of less importance than many gamers will assume. Now, through the guide postcards, each individual single game of Charterstone is unique during the campaign. There's always some form of restriction or bonus in place each game that's what kept things interesting. Like, we personally found some of these very annoying, while others were awesome, and we wish they were in play every time. Uh, what I will say here is that each game is totally unique, and you never get the same set of special rules for Scenario twice. And for people who have seen the game or watched the unboxing, yes, there is a reason your two people are different sizes. Which is why the legacy portion of the game is replayable with the refresh pack. Now, while the basic worker placement mechanic of place a worker or collect all your workers stays the same, and you're always going to be dealing with the same six resources and gold, what you're going to focus on and with each of these mechanics will change each game. So a solid foundation the game builds up from, you have to say. Now, one of the things that took us a bit to get used to is the fact Charterstone is a competitive legacy game. Because the group I played with, Corey and Kat and Deanna and I, is the same group that played through Pandemic Legacy and the same group that played through a big chunk of Gloomhaven. And I've got to say it felt a bit odd playing a competitive legacy game after those two games. Like the first game, we, we just kind of felt like we wanted to trade resources with each other and all build the city together. In the end, though, we all got into it and found we really enjoyed the competitive elements of the game. Unlike some other worker placement games, Charterstone can get quite cutthroat at times. And while there aren't many ways to directly screw over your opponents, it's more about getting certain things before them or making sure you also get rewarded when your opponents do something. Timing? and hate drafting more than direct effects. It's not multiplayer solitaire, but you're not smiting your neighbors either. Although there are some personas later in the game that get a little smitey. <laughs> now, everyone in our group really enjoyed our Charterstone campaign, with games being engaging enough that some nights we finished two in a row. There was one night we talked about a third game, but we didn't do it. I just wanted to stretch it out a little further. I was worried the game was going to start to feel repetitive because, like I said, the basic mechanics and the resources don't change. The tracks are all there. Uh, well, there was a bit of that, like by the end, especially it did start to like you kind of doing the same things. That whole guidepost system really helped to mix things up each game. Now, where this fell apart was playing after we finished the campaign. Well, yes, you can continue to play your copy of Charterstone after you're finished. The campaign we all found it just wasn't a very rewarding experience like we did find that the game worked surprisingly well um everyone takes on the role of a random chart and there's a new drafting system to determine what you start each game with for example the personas you're going to take all the personas you've unlocked shuffle them and draft some there's other stuff you're also going to draft mechanically it was sound and I've got to say, felt very well balanced. The, the game we played, our scores were close the whole time. Like it was a race going around the track, everyone leapfrogging each other. It was a, and it was a really neat. Honestly, the best part about doing it was getting to play someone else's charter. Um, I basically, I played Tori's charter. I had the yellow charter. Someone else played D's charter. Someone played one of the charters that, um, that wasn't played by a player. That part was neat. The problem though, with playing a completed game of Charterstone is that it just didn't feel like it mattered. There were no stakes. It's, a, it's, a, it's one standalone game. And if you win, you win. Yay, you, you won your game of Charterstone. You don't get anything new. You don't get to carry anything over. You don't get to improve your charter. You don't get to do anything that'll pay off later. Well, yes, you can still build buildings and unlock crates, assuming you haven't gone through everything in the deck. And we most definitely did not. There was still plenty of stuff to build. And yeah, the board may change, but the changes you make affect a charter you may never, ever play again. And it just, I don't know, it just didn't give that I've improved myself and I get to be better later because of what I did. It's completely gone. Yeah, and I must say that this is supported by pretty much every other review of this game who'd made it that far that I read. It's interesting that you can play it, but why would you is sort of the general consensus that I pretty much saw everyone who finished the yeah. game mentioning it. Yeah, you can. Yay. 
<laughs> yeah, having tried play to finish game of Charter Stone, I don't think I'll ever do it again. Um, the only thing I can see being useful for as someone who who runs local gaming events, or you know, if you didn't get to play the one game while you were down, is this might be a way to introduce the game to someone who's curious. Like, oh, what's Charter Stone all about? As long as they're not too worried about, you know, seeing buildings and having things in play that aren't there at the beginning. Um, I could see like just using it to show off Charter Stone. Like, hey, come check this game out. Because there's no reason I couldn't now go play my copy with a group of five other strangers and we might have a pretty solid board game experience. But personally, what I'm much more interested in and very tempted to do is to pick up the recharge pack and play through a totally new campaign. Because the thought of playing through the campaign knowing what we know now would be a completely different experience than that first playthrough. So the spoilers will impact how you play, but not necessarily lessen your enjoyment of the game. No. Though I do expect that if only some people at the table knew the spoilers, it might be more problematic. I, I don't know about problematic. Like I think that player will still get the joy of, Hey, this new thing's been unlocked, but it, they're, I, they're going to have a tactical advantage for certain scenarios, knowing what's going to happen, right. um, especially with the goals when you get those multiple choices, um, like even in game two, like I, I, we all would have played game two very differently. Right. Um, game nine, I think, was another big one. Like there were certain games that, that did things at the end that knowing ahead of time could totally change the outcome. Now, the biggest concern I think every group is going to have with Charterstone is being able to find a group of players willing to play through 12 rounds of the same game. Um, board game industry, the board game players, the common how people play games nowadays is not to repeat play the same game over and over. Um, it's usually a small handful of games, if that, if not just one and done. Now, while the game does include rules for adding and removing players, and they work, they work fairly well, but they just feel forced. Um, more interesting to me are the automata or automa. Sorry, I always want to say automata. They don't, Jamie doesn't call it automata. It's automa. It's an Italian word uh, that lets a bot play in any charters not played by characters. No, you cannot start with a bot. You can add them after game one. I think if you're thinking that you may have someone join in your campaign, like at game one, if you're like, we're starting with four people, but Dave may join us later when you know he's off shift work or whatever. I think start using that bot right away. Like I, I strongly recommend use bots for any inactive charter so that when someone does join, they end up in pretty good shape. And I also recommend if someone leaves, keep using a bot for that charter in case someone rejoins or just to keep them competitive until the end of the game. Now again, all of this works, but to me, it's just not the ideal way to play. If possible, you want to start and finish your campaign with the same players throughout. It's going to lead to a more balanced ending, and it's going to make sure that everyone gets to take part in all aspects of the story and get to evolve with the game instead of being thrown in like Sean was to the deep end with all this stuff already unlocked. Not surprising, given that almost every legacy game is similar. The fact that they do have these methods of introducing players as they do, uh, and the Ultima to sort of keep them playing along is the odd part out. And again, you don't have to use the Atoma because there is a system as part of setup where you're going to build buildings for them even without the Atoma. So it's not completely abandoned. So overall, our group, my game group, really enjoyed Charterstone. Uh, this is a competitive worker placement game that slowly evolves and improves as you play through it. There's an engaging story that features a lot of later payoff for early decisions. There's also a campaign that, where playing the long game can pay off and winning a specific individual game can be way less important than the improvements you make during that game to your charter. Remember that. Don't rage quit if you lost the first three or four games. You still have a lot of game left and potential to win. Yes. If you can find a group of gamers who dig worker placement games and are willing to commit to playing the same game 12 times, you should be picking up Charterstone. I realize the MSRP is up there, but split the cost with your group. You're going to get a lot of game out of those 12 plays. And I don't see any reason not to pick up Charter Stone. If you're, you like worker placements, this is a fantastic worker placement experience. Just don't expect to get more than 12 plays. If your group yeah. likes it afterwards, great. But don't expect it to wow you going in. 
but then maybe budget for picking up that fairly cheap recharge pack because you may get a full 24 games out of your copy of Charter Stone. Now, if you got a core group of six gamers, but with some players who can't make it all the time, or a group where you get a different group of six every session, I think you could have a great time playing through a Charter Stone campaign. My only suggestion is to make sure everyone's there for the first game and then use the Atoma for any players not present on game night. Fantastic option that not a lot of games give you. Now, if you and your group don't like worker placement games, while there's a small chance Starter Stone may win you over, it's probably not worth the risk, especially at the cost. Now, I do want to point out, though, the one mechanic that many people don't like about worker placement games is the fact you can't go on a spot that's taken. That's not in effect here. This is a worker placement game where you can bump the opponents. So you basically can place your workers anywhere you want. So other players' workers don't actually limit what you can do on your turn. They're not limiting you, but you are giving a bonus to the person yes. whose people you replace. Now, as for groups looking for an epic fantasy campaign that tells you an epic quest and an ongoing, evolving story, you're probably better off sticking to other campaign games. While Charterstone has some fantasy elements, it is very much a Euro worker placement game at its core. You're not going to be battling any monsters or delving any dungeons here. It felt very... I, I want to say fluffy for fantasy in elements in, in the one game I played. Certainly no sword swinging. No. And no rolling to hit, tracking hit points or any of that. Now, before I go, I want to share a few more of our group's thoughts on Charterstone and specific aspects of the game we enjoyed based on things we unlocked. Now, I can't do that here without spoiling some things in the game. So I've broken those out after this. Now, note, I will not be spoiling any of the story or the surprise twists. I'm just going to be talking about the cool mechanics and systems that are added to the game. So this may be where you want to check out and try it for yourself. Now, fair warning, knowing any of this is not going to ruin the game in any way. These aren't the kind of spoilers where you're going to change your decisions because you know they're coming. All right, so first off, talking about Charter Stone without spoiling it is hard. Um, it's especially hard now, 12 plus games in, when it's hard to remember what was an added rule and what was part of the game from the start, made even more difficult because you overlay stickers in the rule book. So I couldn't even look up what the heck the stupid card is, the name of it. I had to Google the rule book and find an unedited version of the rules to find it. Um, but I think in the above, I may not spoil anything. I at least didn't spoil anything that's not unlocked by game two. Now that's about the change. So again, if you don't want to know how Charterstone changes your play, jump ahead to the next segment now. You're going to want to jump ahead. So one of the things we unlocked very early in our game of Charterstone are minions. Minions are awesome. These are additional workers you can purchase that let you take more actions on your turn, but minions can only be placed in your own charter. In addition to this, every minion gives you a bonus, both when you place it and when someone else uses a spot, you have a minion on. So that was the whole thing I mentioned about trying to plan out your strategy so that when your opponent gets something, you also get rewarded. It's all about putting your minions on your valuable spots and like begging, come on, go ahead and use it. Now, each minion has its own uniquely shaped meeple. And I got to say, unlocking the cat minions first um, did probably affect our joy of unlocking minions even more awesome. Now, of all the things you unlock in Charterstone, I think the minions had the biggest impact on play. So, and well, they're cats. Some of them. There are multiple different minions, each unlocking different abilities. Now, another early unlock for us was Peril. These are tiny colored cubes, which I'm not sure why they're so small, that are scattered all over the board at the start of the game. I say scattered, there's one place in every building. Uh, these represent bad things happening in your village and include things like famine, bandits, and fuel shortages. Now, sadly, this theming got lost. Um, our group just referred to them as cubes in various colors. Not once in our game did someone say, I'm going to go work on this disrepair. They just said, hey, give me that blue cube. Yeah, I'm sure you told me what they were when I played, uh, but it very clearly wasn't important. No, no, it's it's the Lords of Waterdeep effect. I used three orange guys and a black guy to <laughs> trade this in. Now, what I did like about Peril is that as the game unlocked, or went on, we unlocked more and more things we could do with them in the form of additional buildings and gold cards. Like the first couple games they came out, it was just kind of annoying. Like mainly there's a rule where you can't place a minion unless it's an empty spot. So it meant that I couldn't place my minions in turn one. Um, 
But later, by the end of the campaign, they end up turning into a big source of income and points by the end. So peril is a currency. Which I got to say is a little weird. And then turning in the peril at the ice cream shop to get points felt a little more abstract than it should have been. <laughs> but again, if you're just thinking of a cubes, it's fine. Now, the big next big unlock that really changed things up were the Sky Islands. Uh, this is one of the things that in that game three got dropped on us with other things. Uh, what a unique system. Uh, it's a way to give everyone more way to build and more room to build, plus more options during setup. Now, the rule that you have to use to every game, I got to say, can be frustrating, especially when you first unlock them and there's nothing on them because they just built all these things. I don't want to cover them up. And then there's the choice of do I cover up an empty spot on my board with an empty Sky Island? But then I also want something on that board eventually, so I have to cover up something good. Like, there's some really interesting decision points added with sky islands and i've got to say at the very end of the campaign our last three games or so it was interesting to see everyone to try to scramble to try to build at least something on every island so they could get that end game scoring always fun when you've got a mechanic that makes your players scramble <laughs> now there was one aspect of the game we i almost want to say we didn't touch but it was there is crafting items now as the person who controlled the index pulling cards out it's kind of hard not to spoil it when you're you're flipping through looking for small numbers i kept seeing these cards and i'm like oh these look awesome well we didn't unlock the ability to craft items until game 11 i think it was and in that game one crafting card came up the entire game i think someone bought it and did it now during game 12 we saw two so crafting made pretty much no impact on our campaign I found disappointing because it's a really cool system where you get the card and then trade in a set of resources to build the thing, and then you get a reward for it, mostly points, but also other stuff. And I'm like, ah, oh, because I got to say, playing through the first 11 games, our resources were just kind of these things we traded in for money, like then, and we used them to build specific buildings. But pretty early in the game, we made we had a way that we didn't have to pay resources to build buildings. So resources were just kind of like there. And there were some neat combos to get money. Whereas if you had crafting, it's like, oh, now I really care about getting, say, steel and wood to be able to build this hammer. Yeah, and this is part of the random legacy factor and why every playthrough is going to be different. Yeah, like if someone had unlocked these game one, the whole campaign would have played different. It would have been all about amassing big piles of resources to build items. And that was not our goals. We were much more about using your resources to get money and trading money in for points was kind of how many of our campaign games went. Now, as for the twist at the end, um, I predicted it pretty much from game, well, game two. Um, when you get the first, you're happy, happy or sad. And I, though I got to say, I did not expect it to play out the way it did. I will say it was very rewarding. What wasn't overly rewarding, that was the end of game 11, right? Was the end of game 12. After adding up everyone's points and seeing who won, there was just, very little story. I wanted to read three, four cards. I wanted a finale. I wanted a denouement. Not just they throw a parade in your armor, in your honor, and here you go. Here's how you play now if you want to keep playing. I would have liked more fanfare at the very end. It, it just felt slightly anticlimactic. Maths and rules. Not the most satisfying wrap-up. Now, as already mentioned, Charterstone was pretty much perfect for our group. We had a great time playing it. I'm glad we took the time to play through the entire thing before reviewing it, though, as you didn't really get the full experience without playing through a full campaign. Like, I totally didn't even know there was crafting items, except I kept seeing cards that look like that's probably obviously what they're for. But, like, we never even got to experience that. Um, we only unlocked all the minions because we got to a part in the game that says, if you haven't unlocked them all, unlock the rest. Like, we didn't actually unlock them all. Um, I, I just think this game overall is going to be great for a lot of different groups of people and the investment's high so you got to make sure you have that buy-in um but like and it's not really a good try before you buy a game but i think a lot of game groups are going to enjoy this one um especially if you've already enjoyed legacy games i think playing a competitive one is a nice twist if you played through all the pandemic legacies throwing this on the table is going to be a nice I don't know, Peregrim shift for your group. And I think you're going to enjoy that aspect of it. It took a bit to sell us, but once we got there, we played pretty cutthroat going forward. Well, that's really it for our review <laughs> of Charterstone. Now, when you have time, I also welcome you to check out the written version of this review over at tabletopbellhop.com.